<laughs> Hi, this is Lilia with the Help Your Sales podcast. And today I have Lynn Castles. Is it Castles or Cassell? It's Castles. Yeah. Castles. Uh, with me from Lynnbreak Croft. Now, Lynn, thank you so much for taking the time out because I know you've got 150 acres of work to do up there. <laughs> <laughs> so I really appreciate your time. And um, I was just saying before we came on air about your the documentary. Congratulations. It is absolutely fantastic. So I've got so many things I want to talk to you about because I've been lucky enough to come and visit you guys up there. I was totally blown away with, I suppose the, the big thing initially was your lateral thinking and how you kind of took on a bit of land without the perceived understanding and skills that one would think you would have to do something like that. <laughs> and then, so you kind of did it backwards. You got the land and then you made it work um, with really pretty creative thinking. So like, just start for people that have never met you. Can you just start with how you ended up buying Lindbreak Croft? Absolutely. Yeah. Well, firstly, thank you so much for having me on uh, today. You know, we've been trying to make this happen for a long time. So it's really good that it's really good that this is finally happening. Uh, so, yeah, massive gratitude for for inviting us on. And yeah, I mean, the story of, of Limbrek really um, starts many, many years ago. So um, I should stay sort of first out. Um, I'm only one half of the kind of dynamic duo here at Limbrek. The other half is, is my partner, Sandra, who's actually out doing all the work outside right now as I sit and chat to you which is not uncommon uh, <laughs> being from being from Ireland I'm naturally uh, naturally drawn to chatting to people so um so yeah so the whole Limbrek vision started back in 2012 when Sandra and I met uh, when we were living and working down uh, just on the outskirts of London working for the National Trust and we met uh, fell in love that's one half of our story but we also realized that we had the shared vision of living closer to nature so really living closer to the land um we were kind of doing that to some extent, working for the National Trust as rangers, but it was very busy and it just wasn't what we kind of envisaged. You know, we'd envisaged a, a really kind of bucolic, quintessential good life of, you know, a little bit of land, a few chickens, maybe earning, you know, a bit of money seasonally with some camping pots, something like that. But essentially growing our own, all our own food and just having really time to reconnect with nature and, and live off the land. So a couple of years later, um, we did what... Um, what I guess my parents would always tell you never to do, which is quit your job uh, and follow your dreams. So we moved north to Scotland um, because we decided that Scotland was going to be the place where we would um, look for some land. Uh, Sandra's half Scottish, so it seemed to work. And um, being in Scotland meant that we could, you know, use weekends to go and travel around and look for places. So really, Lilia, we were looking for five acres that's all we were looking for and um long story short uh sandra found limbrek just on the on the open market on the internet and it was too expensive but you know after months and months and months of just lo looking and finding nothing we realized one day we were going to be driving right past limbrek croft so we thought hey what's the harm in just having a look and so we did and it was this gorgeous august day there were no midges, there were no ticks. The heather was just deep purple uh, and there was this gorgeous haze over the Cairngorm Mountains and we just fell in love with the place. And that then set us on a journey <clears throat> for the next six months to try and figure out how we could make it happen, how we could raise the money, uh, scrabble it together, getting loans, you know, emptying every single pot of, of funding that we had and then and then making it happen. And so we've got, you know, we arrive here on, I think it was the 18th of March, 2016. And, you know, to Sandra and I, it is the land of milk and honey. It is the land of opportunity. But the funny thing about it is, is that if you were to, if you were to look at Limbrek with what I would kind of describe as kind of standard agricultural eyes, you would just see it as, you know, really nothing important. A little bit of in by, you know, a few fields, woodland, uh, lots of bog, uh, lots of heathery hillside. But I don't know what it was. We just saw it as this place of just pure abundance. And and that's really started us on the journey to then transitioning Limbrek from what was a really a derelict croft to a derelict small, you know, agricultural holding uh, with no agricultural infrastructure to uh, to what it is now today, which is a, a kind of a really kind of vibrant, bustling, uh, small scale farm uh, where we produce uh, pasture, 100 percent pasture beef from our Highland cattle. Uh, we produce uh, pork from our rare breed 
uh, prigs that are uh, on organic feed. We produce uh, pasture eggs from our hens on organic feed and follow a particular grazing pattern and then honey. And then in addition to that, we do loads of stuff like this, talking to you today, really trying to use Limbrek as a place to help people reconnect to their food and reconnect to nature. So in a nutshell, that's, that's <laughs> it. <laughs> It's the biggest nut you've ever seen, right? <laughs> right? I mean, that's the, I think like when you, it's not really a croft. I mean, it's like a huge farm, isn't yeah. it? So the, the, you know, if, if you've not been there, you maybe don't realise the vastness of it. And like you said there, I think traditionally it was derelict because if you came at it from traditional yeah. eyes and how you could make it work, and let's face it, we will have to pay the bills, then it really wasn't something that a traditional, you know, you needed the eyes that you guys brought to oh well, you've got your own micro butchery there mm -hmm. you still yep, have do, that yeah. yep we do yep yep it's still going the other thing that I remember which is quite something these days <laughs> is the, the huge hay shed, shed and the tree hay I'd yep. never even heard that term and it was very evident that you were using like I know a lot of farmers do but um and, and we're moving, I think, back to that direction where you the land benefits from the animals and the animals benefit from the land and we benefit from the animals. And, and so there's a whole symbiotic thing that goes on there. Yeah. That I think in our drive to pay bills, we've kind of moved away from. And what yep. you guys have managed to do is kind of find a way to stay true because you, you talk mm. about this in the documentary, <clears throat> to stay true to your values because it's yep. so difficult to do that sometimes because mm -hmm. you do have to pay the bills mm -hmm. and so then for you to have to be able to create a, to create a model that's so beautiful and even the tours you know of the farm I mean when we came up um I was like this is you know that itself getting mm -hmm. to see how you've done it and learn um and also you what you talk about in the documentary and I've said this for years I said it to my friend Debbie in Malta shit hits the fan I'm going to be back in Scotland because I'll survive there Mm -hmm. You know, Malta's a hot rock mm -hmm. and to try and feed the people that are on there from what you can grow in, um, on the island and water. Yep. But as here in, in Scotland, yeah, we complain about the rain and all that. <laughs> the reality is we will absolutely survive. If the yep. supermarket lorries stop rolling in, if they yep. were, how disabled are we if we can't, if we don't know the land anymore? We don't have our connection to food. We don't know how to grow our vegetables. Because mm -hmm. that's another thing, amazing thing you've got up there. I think it's called a Shetland polytunnel. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> One that basically cannot get blown away. <laughs> no. in the high, in the high Himalayas up there. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, and I think, you know, it's becoming more evident. I was actually watching a <clears throat> podcast this morning about hormonal balance for women. Mm -hmm. If you're eating food that's actually not eating food. And if the soil doesn't contain all the nutrition all the nutrition and you go into that menopausal stage where mm -hmm. everything changes within the body and then there is no nature to provide the the, the natural, the wild medicine um, mm -hmm. for you and how all these dis eases are mm -hmm. simply this disconnection from food. So, yeah. so you guys have got a really lovely system going on because at the farm that I'm living at in Barmola we're primarily food veg mm -hmm. veggies plants and mm -hmm. um, we've got an amazing girl right now who's planting a whole herbal medicine but you guys have I think we need animals too don't we if we genuinely want to work with the rhythms and the cycles of nature if we want no footprint you're not going to be a vegan in winter in Scotland it's just not really going to work is it so yeah would you like to talk to that? Yeah, and I think I think you've touched on on loads of really good stuff. Um, and as you say, that the sort of the little film that we've just uh, put out, you know, we we talk a lot about in it. But I think, yeah, I think I think food. I mean, we're obsessed with food. Like literally, it's pretty much like it's pretty much what we mainly talk about and it's what we spend so much of our time doing so growing food preparing food processing food storing food harvesting food and the cycle goes on and the more that we've kind of got into that the more kind of our obsession has grown because we realize that it's basically 
fundamental it's core in addition to our mental and physical well-being but it's kind of what drives all of that you know that gut microbiome is the engine it is the engine for everything in our body so so it's a kind of a good I think it's a healthy obsession that we have and I think in relation to what we produce uh, you've touched on something really kind of pertinent um, especially for the times that we're living in which is the production and farming of not just vegetables but in terms of animals and there's you know, there's so many binary arguments, as you'll know, about, you know, eating meat versus not eating meat, you know, plant based versus not plant based. You know, there's so many nuances and we can't simply say one is good and one is bad. I believe I think there are so many arguments for and against both. And I think looking at all in the context of nature and looking at all in the context of what we are, which is, you know, as mam mammals, as omnivores, that all has to feed into our, our kind of dietary considerations. And personally, what I always talk about is the sentience of plants and animals. Um, you know, the plants we, we now know in the world that we live in is that plants communicate with each other. They talk to each other. They can raise defenses. If one's being attacked, you know, others can send chemicals through the, the kind of the mycorrhizal network to help each other out. You know, they have communities, they have structure, they have all this kind of incredible relationship. So so plants, in, in my opinion, I, I would say are, can def, are definitely defined as sentient. Just so are animals, as we now know, you know, and we can we can relate to animals so much easier, can't we? You know, they have they have brains, they have, you know, a similar kind of biological setup to we are so they're much easier to relate to and then I guess you know you could say empathize with and then I guess you could take it one step further and we anthropomorphize animals you know we kind of we you know we put our human instincts so what they're what we're thinking onto them and so that in itself can lead to all sorts of interesting relationships interesting challenges um but in terms of how we i guess turn our animals into meat here at limbrek is one that i think we've tried to do based on a whole lot of different principles so it's been about working with i think one of our favorite farmers he's this he's this guy called joel salatin he's this big american guy with this you know, like huge personality and he talks about the animalness of the animal so he, that really refers to you know the animal's natural instincts so you know let's take our pigs for example so pigs in the wild if they were wild boar which is what they would be have been domesticated from they love to get their snouts in the ground they love to break up the ground uh, that's them looking for food so they disturb areas um and they'll kind of move through and they'll disturb areas as they're rooting and tootling they'll eat roots they'll eat shoots they'll eat they'll eat anything they're omnivores and then they're constantly moving on constantly moving on so when we keep pigs here at limbrek you know we don't want to keep them in kind of like well we won we don't want to keep them inside no way we don't want to keep them on concrete we don't want to keep them in cages you know that is not what we do we think well what do they do in the wild we take all those instincts and we think can we replicate that here so whenever we're planning for our pigs we think we want to keep them in areas where they're going to be able to do all this th all this stuff naturally uh, and in addition to that they get like a little hut with some straw which is where they can kind of nest in and go to go go back to home to so to speak uh, so they're really comfortable at all times and then in addition to what they forage naturally we give them a feed and it's all organic uh, feed that we give them mm -hmm. So really it's about taking these natural instincts working with them um, and then looking at what they, then give back to the land. So by disturbing these patches of soil, uh, they're creating a couple of things. So they're creating, say, opportunities for relic seed seeds in the seed bank to grow because the uh, ab above ground is you know disturbance has happened or it's it's opening up a patch of bare soil for say like a wildflower or a tree seedling or a different grass to grow. So you know in addition to that, because they're you know all of us poo <laughs> It's not very glamorous, but it's actually incredible. Um, their poo is feeding the soil. So they're creating, so they're giving back. Okay. So we're they're taking and they're giving back. They're taking and they're giving back. Um and the 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 impact that, that has on the land is regeneration. And that's incredible. Then at the end of the time that the pigs are with us, the pigs are usually with us uh, until they're about eight months old. So uh, we take them to the abattoir ourselves. In order to sell meat to the public in the UK, you have to put them through an abattoir. There is simply no gray area on this. There's no blurred lines. So we take them to the abattoir ourselves um, after a period of preparation so that the whole process will go as smoothly as possible as we can for them. Then we walk them into the abattoir ourselves. And after that, the 
you know, the killing process is done fairly swiftly. And then they come back to Limbrek where they're processed through our micro butchery and then sent out into the community. And that really incredible food and that incredible story all goes out to the people in our community, which then has that continued regenerative impact because this is good stuff that's going into people that's fueling their body and then that's giving them health and rejuvenation. So that's kind of one example of how for us that works. Yes, absolutely. And I think, you know, I remember when I was in Africa, you know, they know the animals. Mm. <laughs> that was the thing I think that really struck me. And they know the, the animals, granny and grandpa, and, you know, yeah. literally they are part of the community. Yeah. And, um, and that's what you guys do so beautifully. And Thank also you. I think, you know, looking at community wealth building, which is something I've become really interested in, it's all about these social interactions there's much much more than just good food getting exchanged there mm -hmm. you know as you were saying it's that i mean there's nobody i know that's not obsessed by food maybe mm -hmm. one or two people <laughs> because that's ultimately we come that's how we survive yeah and it's how we've always survived and if we're not finding creative ways to create great food then how are we how could we ever be the best version even physically never mind mentally emotionally and spiritually um yeah. so you know i think when you feed people and I've just spent the weekend you know seaweed's my new thing bringing seaweed into things and obviously wild mm -hmm. foraging and Claire was down we did a retreat you need to come on that it's not fair. I know I know I know Sandra <laughs> did once my turn next <laughs> yeah absolutely where I'm really you know the the process for me is so incredibly rewarding and satisfying mm -hmm. and exciting mm -hmm. and then people love the food you know so there's a whole load of invisible stuff that goes on there that's not just about the harvest whatever yeah. you're harvesting um so the, and i think from community wealth building um chat these social interactions are what make how i get to know you mm. and how i get to know lundbrecht croft mm -hmm. and the thought and the love and the care and the heart that goes into that which i simply could not get by going into a supermarket and picking something up and paying for it no for and, sure and i think that's one of the things that's been that we've lost as, as our communities whether it's been deliberate or not, does it even matter? We're breaking the communities down. We don't have these social points anymore, like the pub or the community hall, although it's all coming back. Yeah. Um, you know, how do we get to know each other? Food is an yeah. absolute no-brainer. Everybody loves it, everybody's interested in it. Um, so, you know, well done on being able to show a model because I'm sure people watching this now and I want to talk about the documentary and how that came about, etc. Mm -hmm. as well. But mm -hmm. you know, what we want to do at Bar Moloch is for people that have got these ideas, and there are a lot of them because they message me and they say, I want to grow my own food, I want to do this. Yeah. You're inspiring and showing a way. Yeah. You know, and people can come and learn from you as they can come and learn from us. Yeah. Um, this is how we are doing it. And how do you um how many people do you need? Because mm -hmm. you know, we need people. Mm -hmm. You know, when I was out in Canada recently and, you know, my sister and all her friends that live out kind of in the outback 20 kilometres away from the village, mm -hmm. um, they've all got tens and tens and sometimes hundreds of acres just to themselves. And I thought, well, to work this land, you're going to need people. Yes, yes. <laughs> it, can't, it can't happen. So I think, and then let's not kid ourselves on working together with people that are brings its own challenges as well, doesn't it? You have Absolutely. to get the right people all with the same kind of, and we have to be a lot more tolerant of each other. And then there's all the the systems and the bureaucracy. I know, you know, with the butchers, you ha they're very strict. Um, mm -hmm. You have to, all of that has to be managed. It's not, mm -hmm. it's not just all glory and nature and... <laughs> There's a lot of other things that we need to deal with too, isn't there? Isn't absolutely, there? absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I th I'm just so just so absolutely amazed at what you guys have achieved so let's talk yeah. about the documentary how did that come about um so it's 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 a it's a funny one really so um we um i think really it just came came about via social media connections so we were contacted by hugh uh hugh richards who made the the film and Hugh is this incredibly successful, um, entrepreneurial, beautiful, beautiful soul, um, young guy. 
He's been gardening since I think he was 12 and making YouTube videos since then. And he's now kind of grown this into some kind of huge enterprise where I think now on his YouTube channel, he has about 750,000 followers. He's written three books. Uh, he's got a number of kind of other YouTube channels. And yeah, he's just incredible. And so he contacted us a couple of years back and he said, I'd love to come up and make some videos of you guys. And then I'll put them on my social media channels and my YouTube channel, which has a great following. And then that's new content for me and then hopefully an exposure to a new audience for you. So we said, yeah, sure. So the so his first one that he made was one on our kitchen garden, uh, which was just with Sandra. And that's about a 15 minute sort of short video on the kitchen garden, which is amazing I, I'll, I'll send you the link to that one as well because that's just incredible and then he decided to make a kind of a longer form conversation as well um, which I think was initially going to be about 15 or 20 minutes turned into half an hour because he just yeah he just captured so much and it was glorious weather and you know it was just everything was looking brilliant so so that's kind of how it really came about and I think um, I think one of the things that I sort of I guess there's a couple of things on, on that you've just been saying that I think we mentioned in, in the sort of the, this little film. And one is is the role of people and the role of nature. And I talk about how, you know, a few years back, I looked up the definition of nature in the dictionary and I looked up a few and not one single one includes people. It's sort of nature is defined as everything that is not people related. And I just thought, what? This is this is insane. We've defined ourselves out of nature. This is the problem. This is where the problem starts, you know. Um, so we talk a little bit about that in the documentary. And I think the other thing is this this definition of wealth. You know, what does wealth mean? And you've been talking beautifully about community wealth. And I think in the documentary, I talk about how we really started to redefine our relationship with wealth and what it means. Because, you know, if I'm very honest to me, you know, if you'd have asked me 10 years ago what wealth would have meant, I would have said money. It would mean lots and lots of money. It would mean, you know, if you're wealthy, you've got lots of money, you can go on lots of holidays, you can buy lots of nice things. You know, that to me is what wealth would have been. And then I think our journey at Limbrek has transitioned us into redefining not just redefining nature, but redefining wealth. And for us, wealth is, yes, of course, having enough money to pay the bills, as you quite rightly say. Um, but wealth is also, um, you know, food in the kitchen garden. Wealth is wealth is health. You know, my mom always used to say, your health's your wealth. And that is so true. That is not just a, a snapshot. It is very, very true. Um, wealth is the the health of our land. Um, wealth is the health of our animals. Wealth is the health um, uh, of our community around us. So, so, so wealth has kind of come from being this just kind of just money thing to this kind of multiple tree with all these different branches. Um, and that's one of the beautiful transitions that we've made since being at Limbrek. And I think as well, then sort of sharing that with other people and helping them redefine <laughs> wealth in their own world, um, but also making themselves wealthier, you know, continually making themselves wealthier, either by challenging the concept of lack or simply through empowerment. So empowerment of, hey, wouldn't it be amazing if you could like grow three to four thousand pounds worth of veggies in your kitchen garden that are like they're beyond organic you know organic is like so not good enough for these veggies mm -hmm. you know imagine the health that's giving you and then you know imagine imagine putting that into your body imagine putting that kind of like quality gold star fuel into your body imagine then waking up in the morning and going oh I feel quite good today I feel quite energetic and then you know just mixing in all these other different sort of you know, lifestyle, life choice related um, experiences. And then you start, it's, it's that, it's that kind of, you know, snowdrop that turns into a snow draw, snow, you know, snowball that turns into an avalanche that turns into something massive. And I think the more you can just make all of those accessible to individual people, then, you know, the greater that avalanche will flow. Absolutely. And I love the way you're saying imagine. That's how I started the festival. I played John Lennon's Imagine. Oh, lovely. Ah. I was like, imagine, because this is one of our superpowers, our imagination. Yeah. Like you guys imagine that place into life. You know, it's, and that's, I think, something that we've just lost because we've, we've stopped thinking for ourselves, haven't we? We've stopped kind of, again, that's changing. There's definitely an energy. You know, people are you know, coming towards us as well as I'm sure they are towards you. Going, what are you doing? How do we do this? We want good food. And um, and you know that we need to, I was talking talking at Scottish Parliament 
a few months back and there was a woman there who was from a farmer's kind of charity talking about their mental health and we were saying oh. we need to rebrand the farming and bloody hell our farmers are the most important people <laughs> you know along with the people that collect our rubbish mm -hmm. um you know these are two things that you how did they ever get so d downgraded i do not understand it no, and especially no. in scotland where we have such tremendous land i know my friend from newcastle she looks around and she says your sheep are so lucky up here because they're just <laughs> cutting about the hills right you know they're they're yeah. exactly like you describe they're just having a lovely life and yeah. we take that for granted and i think again going back to the supermarket thing it it not only does it mean you don't know the people who are producing your food it it, it detaches you we're just we've detached ourselves from nature and now we're detached ourselves from the food chain detached ourselves from the soil <clears throat> you know and we're disease chronic degenerative disease is an all-time high mm -hmm, mm -hmm. people's mental health is crumbling and breaking down there is nobody in a laboratory anywhere that can fix that mm -hmm. it has to come back to the communities and start at the very basics get the soil right the this soil and the the the, the soil the the biome of the la of the planet you absolutely know, our, you know um our, where the life force comes from yeah, so uh, yeah. The definitely the that film, that documentary, um, is going to help spread the word of what you're doing. So, tell us what people. I know that Claire's coming up. When's Claire back up there? Uh, I think she's coming in July. July. I'm going to try and yeah. come up then too. So, yeah. Um, yeah. Sandra said specifically. She was like, one, say hello to Lilia. So hello, <laughs> and two, get Lilia to come up and see us again. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's it's definitely on my radar. Um, so what what are you looking for now in terms of do, can people just come and visit? Are there are there specific times for that? Are you running courses? Are you running retreats? What what are you what are you seeing? Where can people get your meat if they wanted? Do you have any extra? <laughs> <laughs> it's hot stuff. It sounds like hot cakes, as they say. So um so on the first topic of of yeah so we do we do do uh tours so we we do a uh, four public tours in the year um we have a website it's just limbrettcroft.co.uk and um people can book onto the tours um for a public tour we also offer private tours where we kind of just arrange um time specifically for people to come and again that can all kind of be sort of done through our website um we also run a few courses in the year so um we run a couple of uh, week long courses, which is called Living Off the Land. And it's all about everything. You know, you, you would love the course, Lilia, because the first day, the first morning starts with why are you here and what is it that you want your life to look like? It's not about grazing strategies. It's not about butchering. It's not about selling and marketing and business planning. I mean, it is later um, on but unless you really understand why it is that you're here and what it is that you want your life to look like then we you know you're not going to get the most out of the week after that then we kind of go on to you know working with pigs working with cattle working with chickens running a micro butchery setting up a small business from scratch you know sales and marketing social media blah 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 all that kind of stuff but it's a really beautiful four and a half days of people camping on site uh eating uh wonderful food from Limbrek and then kind of getting to getting to know each other so we do a couple of those um we also do a few one day courses. So, yeah, we, we get Claire in to do a, an event on foraging. That's mainly because we just want to learn more about foraging. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a great reason. <laughs> yes. Well, Claire and I were just saying that. I said, every time I meet you, I learn more. And she said, yes, yeah, same, same. And yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. You know, that's what's so lovely about it. Yeah, you know, exactly. Buzz, get together with people that just love this stuff and are yeah. so open and willing to learn more exactly so so yeah so that's that's a really fun one um then uh we do a, a one day living off the land event so you know that's for people that maybe can't afford the four and a half days and we try and smush it into one day um and and kind of just put some key highlights in uh we also do like a half day uh how to set up your own kitchen garden you know our kitchen garden you know we were saying about we, we have 150 acres our kitchen garden has actually a relatively small footprint 
you know, when you look at the kitchen garden, uh, the poly crab uh, and a small soft fruit garden and from the kitchen garden and the poly crab alone, we we reckon we're on a kind of a solid 95 percent vegetables of our year round intake just in those two areas. So it's really kind of getting people into it and going, you know, think about the size of your garden. What could you do there, considering as well that where we are is really exposed, you know, wind beaten, we get snow when even down in Granton, you know, it can be sunshine. So, you know, we're producing even, you know, at this massive, high, massively high altitude in such abundance. So we do kind of little courses like that as well. Um, and those are all really great ways for us to share the message, to enable and empower people. And it's also a good stream of income for us. You know, it's a good diversification because the meat produce is only the meat, uh, eggs and honey is um, is I say that's the kind of the core of what we do. Uh -huh. um, but it wouldn't it wouldn't provide for us entirely. So we're by diversification pulling all that together. Uh, so we do, as I said, we do pasture beef. We do one release a year of that, and that's in October. And basically, people sign up to our mailing list, and we put an email out. And when it's gone, it's gone. Uh, and I always say, you know, we're one hundred percent pasture and tree leaf fed. You know, in the UK, you can buy grass fed beef, which sounds lovely. 51% is all they need to be fed on grass. The other 49% can come on grains. So it's these things, you know, where you, you wouldn't know. I mean, people come here and they wouldn't know that unless they knew us and we had this conversation. So uh, we do uh, about four or five releases of our uh, rare breed pork um, in a year. Uh, and again, and then uh, our eggs are sold by the, by the roadside or mostly through a subscription club to our local community. And then honey is just as and when it's ready. Uh, so so kind of stuff kind of drips and drabs but the main place for people to find out about stuff when it's available is to look on the website or to sign up to the mailing list join the mailing but list it does go like hotcakes yeah yeah no I, I, I remember that from when we visited you so yeah. well, that's fantastic so um yeah I mean I think like well obviously one of the big things for us for bringing people onto the land is accommodation yeah is that, yeah is that an issue for you it is, yeah. We don't have any accommodation here. What is planning like up there? Um, it's it's um. I mean, we've never really had any problems with it. We are in a national park, so that does um, put additional uh, sort of considerations uh, on planning. Um, but I think if you've got a good case for it, it's it's not impossible. Right. Okay. That sounds. Yeah. That sounds good. Yeah. 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 Well, listen. Um. Send me all the links for people yes. that want to check out what the courses. Um, yes. Get onto your mailing list. Yeah. Watch these documentaries, which are super inspiring, and just at least pretty much you guys just sitting in a chair in that beautiful bit of land, <laughs> chatting about <laughs> your, the, which is just really all you need. I think now we're realizing these conversations. Yes. You know, I've done a few things recently um, locally. And I thought, my God, I would never have known all that stuff if I hadn't been there. You you know, we think we're getting a lot of information um, online, which we do in social media, but it's the sure. conversations. That's where yeah. all the the magic comes out, the story. Yes. You know, the, the inspiring and powerful stories. Um, and that's an easy way to learn and listen. Is yeah. when it's, you know, when it's intriguing and entertaining and inspiring, you're like that. Oh, right. Okay. Absolutely. And relatable, isn't it? It's all when it's very relatable and it's human stories. I think that's our, that's our superpower as humans is to, is to share stories. And when we share stories that, you know, people can relate to and we share it in an accessible format, uh, then that's the best way to get messages across rather than, you know, telling people, you know, it's, it's, it's yeah. just, it's just, it's just, it's just sharing at the end of the day. Ab sharing exactly it's so freaking simple mm. <laughs> <laughs> all this stuff is. Yeah. and you know interestingly because a big part of um community wealth building is land reform and community owned yes um, and you know i'm lucky every day i know that owns land is very community minded yeah. but i think in terms of what seems to happen is and again going back to community wealth building principles is that people we need to stand up and take ownership and be willing to take responsibility like yeah. you, know, you have to walk your dog in that rainy morning you know do you want this well there's going to be things that you're going to have to do absolutely push yourself out your comfort zone but primarily I don't see that any land anyway is actually being belonging to anybody it's the stewardship isn't it and the more land you have again if we have to provide food you're going to need humans there to help you um you know make that happen 
Yeah. So I think when we look as the la- at the land as part of nature, which we are part of, <laughs> and we can all get together and go, what's the best way to do this without any egos, without any you know power structures or struggles? Because um, I know at the farm, the things that the boys create out of wood, and you're just like, oh my God, that's amazing. Yeah. And time as well, isn't it? If you're yeah. only focus is, well, how can we get, you know, keep the animals happy, get great food and everything is in that symbiotic relationship. Mm-hmm. You don't really need much else. No, and I think I think your 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 point about stewardship is so pertinent. And I think the other thing that you know, I think I've learned as being a steward of a land is that I am not a land manager. I'm not a manager of anything. I mean, maybe I am of my myself, but certainly everything out there, um, you know, I am not. Because I think if we manage, that's a very kind of egotistical human element, isn't it? We've got to control and we've got to manage it. And I think it's it's taking that taking that weight off of our shoulders, first of all, mm-hmm. stepping back from the fear of letting go, and then just going, how about I don't try and control or manage everything? How about I just work with it? What would that look like? And I think that's the kind of the bedrock of what we try to do here. It's all about constantly working with that symbiosis, that cyclical nature and of giving and receiving all the time rather than that has to look like that. It has to go there and it has to stay in this format and it can never change. You know, so it's all about stewarding and working with and, and kind of finding our place rather than imposition of ego absolutely and it's the same with healing and the internal ecosystem you know we don't do any of that it does it (laughs) intelligence is doing everything you know the microbiome knows exactly what to do what we really need to do is get out the way Mm -hmm. stop interfering Mm -hmm. and think we know better (laughs) and it's the same with absolutely now you guys have planted thousands of trees did you plant all them yourself yeah, that we we were a bit we were a bit selfish with that. Um, we we wow. started off so we've we've planted just over thirty thousand, uh, and we have more we've more kind of coming this winter. But yeah, we we put um about seventeen and a half thousand up on our hill ground. Uh, so that was our first big project, and then we've kind of added to that through planting. Um, we've planted just under a, a, or around about one point four kilometers of hedging. Uh, we've planted uh crops of trees that we'll harvest for tree hay. So a a, a form of hay which is you know very very similar to grass it's just made out of tree leaves uh that we then can supplementary feed our cattle with during the winter time uh we've extended our existing woodlands we're starting to plant in our fields now so we're planting uh micro orchards so apples plums pears we're planting standard what are called standards so individual trees in a tree box that will grow in our fields and provide you know habitat and shade and shelter for our animals we're, we're that's all the kind of stuff that we're doing uh, in addition to that we've set aside about nine hectares about 18 acres of a more naturally regenerating woodland up on our hill ground too so for us Lilia trees are trees are everything like trees trees are my, my, my huge passion for both of us in life they 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 you know they and there's often so much conflict in farming between uh trees and land and it, it blows my mind that that, that even exists yeah. uh but they're great for shade for shelter for our animals for fodder uh immense habitats you know as you know our climate is changing uh we're getting more extremes you know we're getting more we're you know we can be getting hotter periods in the summer when we desperately need shade and shelter we can be getting windier spells in the winter when we desperately need shade and shelter you know trees are the living barn you know trees are you know nature's free supply of everything that we need so so trees are a big a big thing but yeah we did plant them all ourselves <laughs> I I thought because um <laughs> Helen they planted 5,000 when they yeah. you know, a few years back and um but they get help to do that yeah. and when I was watching your documentary I was like I bet they planted them themselves. <laughs> I think That's we've maybe a lot uh, yeah I think we've maybe allowed about a few hundred in a hedgerow to be planted by somebody else but that was it that was all we could take <laughs> Do you take any volunteers any woofers or no we don't we don't we've never really kind of gone down that route and I guess you know for us it's it's been it's been a kind of a, a multitude of reasons for that one is because we're still 
we're getting better at it now, but we're still figuring out what it is that we're doing. Mm -hmm. And having worked for the National Trust and having run lots of volunteer groups, we never wanted to bring people on when we couldn't give them a really, really great experience. Mm -hmm. So there was that was a reason which we've never taken them on. The other has been the sort of the accommodation side of things. You know, we haven't got anywhere extra for somebody to stay. And also as well, you know, Lilia, if we're completely honest, you know, Limbrek is our home mm -hmm. and we spend so much of our time kind of giving our kind of thoughts, our story, our energy to a lot of people. Sometimes it's actually quite nice to keep the time that we do have here when people aren't here as a little bit of a haven, as a little bit of a, you know, it's our kind of rest and recovery time. So it's always been about that balance. But through offering things like tours and courses, we try and, you know, offer the opportunity to have the Limbrek experience here just in a more structured way for people and for us as well, because we're always trying to balance that you know, we're always inspired, right? I'm sure you're the same, right? You're constantly looking around going, oh my God, we could do this, we could do this, we could do this. You know, so you're constantly inspired and you're constantly, you know, just amazed by the potential here. But we are we always have to just sort of remember that, you know, the, the thing that we talk about with our land and our animals is we have to give them rest. If we don't give them rest, if we don't give our field rest, they won't become more abundant. If we don't give our animals rest, if we don't give anything rest, it's just not going to work. But who are we rubbish at telling that to the most? Mm -hmm. Us. Now we're getting better. We we really are getting better at that. Much, much, much better. But that's also factored into our decision as to whether or not we take people on in a, in a kind of a volunteer capacity as well. Yes. Yeah. I because I mean it can. I know what I did some woofing when I was in South America, and this uh, elder, elderly couple, I older than me. Um, said, oh, can you just stay and I said but the, actually do you know why I didn't stay for longer was I got horrendous hay fever okay I've ever had in my life my nose was constantly running my head was thumping and I actually had to remove myself from the most spectacular farm in Ecuador but I, they said you know mm. sometimes it's just a lot more hassle than it's worth yeah. it's, it's like you just get people that want to travel for free which is fine you know but um yeah also, you, what you're really looking for a bit more is is a bit of wisdom, ideas, yes. creativity, etc., and people that maybe know a little bit can be helpful as well. Exactly. So, yeah. yeah, but I mean, I think that that may or may not organically grow as well, isn't it? Um, yeah. It's one yeah. Of these things you, I think right now we have to just, you know, I didn't realise I was a planner until COVID, and suddenly I was like, you can't plan. <laughs> I thought I flew by the seat of my pants, but it turns yeah. out actually there was an element of planning and now I'm just like, God knows. Next year, what the hell? Yeah, yeah, and yeah, yeah. You just have to roll with whatever's coming up and I and just enjoying seeing the garden growing again and yeah, and just Absolutely. You know, a year of absorbing. You know, yesterday I went out and suddenly I'm like stopping to pick up things, to forage things, and I was like, Oh, that's the first time I've ever done that, even yeah. although I've understood and learned now I'm really seeing it you know and, and yeah going, oh, there's food you yes send food stop the car yes. out again. <laughs> <laughs> you know it's, it's fantastic exactly. and I think that's what keeps you alive is the, the constant yeah. learning and I think it's it's about it is about redefining how we live today you know you think about us ten thousand years ago as hunter gatherers and you know what we used to do was we'd hunt and we'd rest and we'd feast and we'd hunt and we'd rest and we'd feast and we'd forage and you know everything was very seasonal and our, our lives were were not dictated by alarm clocks and by deadlines you know it was all much more kind of in harmony um, you know, you compare that to today, which is really, you know, a, a heartbeat in the in the in, in the kind of the lifespan of Earth, isn't it? Ten thousand years is like is like nothing. And evolutionary, we've just not evolved to live the way that we have. And we've now created, as you know, as many people will know, we've we've created this kind of whip to whip ourselves with is if we're not working all the time. If we're not earning lots of money, you know, if we're not doing this, that and the other, if we're not getting a new car every three years, if we're not getting the holiday every year, you know, we're not successful, we're failing, we're lazy, all this sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, and yet we're, you know, as you've quite rightly said, we're, you know, all of a sudden there are diseases out there which never existed. You know, we are getting sicker, um, we are getting unhappier um, and yet, you know, we're kind of doing this to ourselves and so it's really kind of trying to enlighten people and say you know it's okay it's okay to not be 
on mm-hmm. full pelt all the time. Um, I think where it gets hard and in, in like, I don't know if you find this, but I think what's get hard in our situation is that whenever you sort of start to open your eyes to the abundance that around you, it is in, it just, it's so inspiring all the time. So, you, you know, you're kind of going, diddle, diddle, diddle. so it's all, it's then about taking those breaks and those snacks to just go like, it's, it's, it's cool. We, you know, that's still going to be there tomorrow. Let's just kind of take a step back from that. But it's just really redefining that and readdressing that. And I think that's one of the wonderful things, Lily, about the, the communications today. I mean, we were joking at the start before we came on about how, I'm so glad I don't live on Zoom every day, right? I really am so glad I don't live on Zoom a day. But I am so grateful for what we can access nowadays on social media and podcasts. You know, uh, I've been listening. I, I listen to tons of wellness podcasts on things like we were talking about, you know, about hormone balancing, fasting, you know, all that kind of stuff. I find it absolutely fascinating. Um, and that's all available through the World Wide Web, which is the same as our conversation here today. You know, that's how we found out about you. That's how you found out about us. Mm-hmm. And I think that's what's wonderful about all of this. Yeah, absolutely. And again, it's the balance, isn't it? Mm. It's using it um, and knowing when to step back and get back outside into the unified field. Exactly. Recharged. Well, listen, you know, I knew um, we could stay on here all day discussing all different aspects of life. But um, it's been it's fantastic to see. And congratulations again on the documentary. Thank Put you. Put all the links up for people mm. uh, who want to take it a little bit further, learn a little bit more. And I will hopefully, I'll get the dates from Claire and I'll hopefully see you in July. Great. Wonderful. Okay, yeah, okay. We'd love that. All right. Thank you so much well, again, Lilia. All right. Yeah, that will do. Bye now. Bye. Bye now.